On this episode of Doing the Most, I'm inviting you on a journey with me. We are going to brew up the very first alcoholic beverage that I ever made almost 14 years ago. It's hard to believe I've been brewing this long, but <laughs> here I am, still kicking. You know, a couple years ago, I dipped deep back into my email archives where, you know, I used to email myself stuff as a backup and I found a copy of my wine log. It was the uh, document that I used to keep track of all the stuff I was brewing in. And uh, I found my recipe for the very first thing I ever made. It was a wine, a country fruit wine made with some unconventional ingredients. And I thought, you know, it might be fun to acquire all that stuff, brew it again, and see how it was. I mean, it's been years. It's been, I guess, over a decade probably since I tasted this. And so it seems like a great opportunity, a great time to step back in time and see what I was brewing when I very, very, very first started. So let's take a look at the ingredients for this uh, wine, question mark. I called this recipe Deep Purple. It's got six pounds of blueberries, one pound, eight ounces of dark raisins, 36 ounces of Old Orchard Cranberry, 108 ounces of Old Orchard Apple Raspberry, two ounces of ground black pepper, four pounds of granulated sugar, and one cup of dark oak. I don't have a record of what yeast I used for this, but I'm gonna guess it was probably EC1118. I don't have any of that on hand right now, but I do have a daughter strain of EC1118 called CVW5 from Scott Labs. And so that's what I'm gonna be using to brew this up. There are some perhaps unconventional steps <laughs> to brewing this up. And uh, we'll talk about those as we get this thing going. First off, according to my instructions, I need to bring two gallons of water to a boil with my sugar. I didn't wanna get out my giant stock pot. And so I'm gonna be doing that in a couple of small Dutch ovens. These are each like seven, eight quart Dutch ovens. So those should work just fine. And uh, I gotta crush up some berries and mix those together with the sugar water. And I guess everything else is gonna go into my brewing bucket. When I first started, I was brewing in six to six and a half gallon buckets. And I found that a really relieving thing. I was never worried about shattered glass and I wasn't using buckets with spigots. So I wasn't worried about, you know, kicking one or something and somehow accidentally causing a leak and losing my whole brew. This is pretty simple by the instructions I laid out here. So we're gonna mix this up. We're hoping for a gravity of 1.085 once we have all of our water in. And uh, there's a couple of things in here that I recommend doing like boiling the oak to sanitize it and waiting 24 hours to pitch the yeast and using some Campton during that time to uh, kind of stave off microbial and yeast activity. I'm gonna skip both of those. I'm gonna put the oak right in and I'm gonna pitch the yeast immediately. This recommends oak chips. I used to use oak chips a lot because they were the easiest thing for me to get a hold of. I am instead gonna use oak cubes because it's what I have on hand. So instead of getting like a woody kind of immediate oak, this will be a more holistic, you know, barrel age mimicking kind of oak, except the oak is going into primary and it's riding out the whole of primary. So very different from what I would probably recommend these days. So let's, Jump in, let's get started, and I'll document this as best I can while I'm actively mixing things up here. I have here my bucket. I'm gonna go ahead and dump all the sanitizer out of this. This has been sanitized, but it's still got a gallon of sanitizer in it. I'm gonna need that for other things. So we'll get this dumped out. I'll get some water in the Dutch ovens and we'll get started brewing. Our water is in. Let's get the flame going. get our sugar in. Definitely want to get this moving around. Don't want any of the sugar to settle on the bottom and accidentally burn. Let's try and get it dissolved as quickly as we can. While those are going, our next step is to crush our berries and throw all the ingredients in 
with the sugar water. So I am going to put the blueberries in our bucket down here and then start opening and dumping in all of our concentrates and our black pepper and our oak. I think that is sufficiently crushed. Good enough. Roughly a cup of oak, you know, the most <laughs> accurate way to measure your oak. All right, and now on to our concentrates. Lots and lots of concentrates. Everything is in there other than our water, which finished boiling. Uh, while I was putting the cans of concentrate in here. So let's get that in. Everything's looking good now. Let's just get this all stirred to combine. And then we'll start topping up the water and trying to hit that starting gravity of 1.085. I will say it smells good. It smells like fruit and pepper. This also calls for some pectic enzyme, so I'll go grab some of that and throw a tablespoon or so in as well. currently reading as high as my refractometer can go, so let's get this diluted. Got super darn close here. I'm gonna call that. It's just a little high, but I don't want to go about accidentally diluting it too much, so we're gonna call it around 1.087, not too bad. My recipe calls for two tablespoons of yeast nutrient. Back then I was using diammonium phosphate, so we're not gonna do any calculating like I would these days, because that wouldn't be true to the recipe. So we're gonna just throw two tablespoons in. five grams of yeast. So I racked that into a three gallon carboy after fermentation with a little bit of sparkaloid to help it clear. And once it was clear, I got that into bottles. So we are here at the tasting segment, but I wanted to give a little bit of context on why it went from being about a six gallon batch to a three gallon batch. And that was because I did not plan for all those solids back when I was creating that recipe. So there was just like a lot of stuff that soaked up the liquid in there, like the blueberries and the raisins. And so there was a lot of liquid loss. Uh, it actually ended up being more like four gallons. So a pretty good net on that. But once I filled that three gallon carboy and started filling the one gallon carboy, I kind of was like, what's the point in saving this? You guys know I've got so much alcohol. I don't need like three quarters to four fifths of a gallon of extra wine laying around. So I dumped it, pour one out for 2010 me, I guess. So let's take a taste of my first ever thing that I brewed in 2010, 14 years ago. Actually, you know what? I would not have been drinking out of a glass like this 14 years ago. Let's, uh, let's do this right. There we go. 
Ronald McDonald. That's uh, it's more my 2010 vibe. Looks good. Oh, the days when I could drink a whole pint of homemade wine. It's a different, different time. So as you can see, it's beautifully clear. And the aroma is nostalgic. This does like it, it conjures some memories. I'm really having to dig deep to remember this one. I only ever brewed one batch of this. So I was really into experimentation back then. But it's that the apple juicy kind of like fake raspberry smell that's bringing back the most memories. You can smell the acid profile in this. I can smell, it smells sharp. Okay, let's do it. It is tart, astringent, tannic. The pepper is in there, Woo, it's a little spicy. A little bit thin, definitely would benefit from some back sweetening. Overall, it's drinkable. There are some, some positive takeaways here. I think the black peppercorn, that cracked pepper is, is providing some interesting zhuzh here um, in, in a way that this would kind of fall flat if it weren't for that kind of spicy pepperiness elevating it on the exhale. The acid profile is very sharp. Definitely could benefit from some back sweetening or even just some glycerin. Something to improve the viscosity, but also add just a touch of sweetness to, to balance out what feels like a pretty strong malic acid flavor. It is very cidery. That classic kind of country fruit wine flavor that you get out of juice-based country fruit wines. Uh, and that's the thing that kind of ages out a little bit as some of those uh, complex things break down and marry back together during the aging process. I would say, you know, this one's, it's, it's a few months old at this point. It probably needs more age. It probably needs a lot more age and some back sweetening. I think the next time I open a bottle of this will be eight months or so from now, and I will have a thing of simple syrup or grenadine handy for back sweetening just to see how that changes it. But some interesting takeaways. I think brewing juice-based wines is absolutely something you can do. I think cracked peppercorn is a thing that is fun to play with. I don't know that the raisins really did much at all. Uh, the tannin profile is definitely like a fruit skin tannin profile, so I think that's what we got from the blueberries, but I'm not picking up any blueberry flavors or aromas in here. A fun experiment. I'm curious. Leave a comment if you think I should try and adapt this one to my more modern method of brewing, maybe convert it into a mead, and come up with a recipe for deep purple for y'all that, that aligns with my original vision but is a little bit more drinkable a little bit sooner. Drop a comment, let me know. If you enjoyed this video, hit subscribe, ring that notification bell so you don't miss any of our future content. And until next time, happy brewing and cheers. Homemade brews and various artists, everything from meat to roast. Big creation, fermentation, inebriation, doing the most.